Welcome to Ideas Live. I'm Anne Marie Oman, and this is my co host, Karen Anderson. And we are doing a series of deep conversations about change and how change might be affected in this world. And so we've had a variety of, of, of subjects to talk about poverty, uh, literacy, addiction, all, addiction yeah. all kinds of things that we've talked about. And today, in honor of the month of mothers, in honor of Mother's Day, we're going to be a little bit contrary. And we're going to talk about women who have opted or made the choice not to be mothers. So we're to, our topic this time is childlessness by choice, or mm -hmm. childless by choice, as it's often referred to. And we're doing this not to in any way dishonor mothers because I think that's an incredible choice. But we want to, and we also are not talking about um, people who might want to have children and for medical reasons can't. We're talking about the choice aspect of this particular project. And uh, we've, it's, it's, um, it has an interesting history, we've discovered, mm -hmm. that there are, uh, there's always been a percentage of women who have chosen this. You had some comments about that. Oh, you mean in terms of just the percentages yeah. and mm -hmm. so forth? Yeah. yeah. I was interested to discover that um, about 19% of women remain childless. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I would have thought. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I... I would have thought it was would, less. I think I would have thought it might be more, uh -huh. especially today, because uh -huh. that choice didn't always exist for women. That's right. I mean, certainly when I was growing up, um, the whole issue of availability and reliability of birth control was um, much more restricted. And so the, that choice did not exist mm -hmm. in the same way it does today. Um, but even so, even, even given that choice, um, there are a great many women who choose to have children. And of we, course. Um, so, uh, now even I, between you and me, mm -hmm. you chose to have a child. Mm -hmm. I have chosen not to have a child. Yeah, but there's a, you know, there's a lot of nuance in what we mean by choice. Yes. Because, um, yes, I had a child, but the fact is I got pregnant. We were not planning. My husband mm -hmm. and I were not planning on a child. Mm -hmm. um, we had even thought maybe we would never have children. And then I got pregnant. And it was unanticipated. So I think it, to, to call it a choice, hmm, but it was a, it was a reality we embraced. So yeah. that was the choice part. But um, there's a lot of ways to arrive at motherhood, just as there are to arrive at deciding to not be a mom. I think that's, that's really important. I think many women find that circumstance, I love what you said about joyfully embracing it. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that is many women have a sort of notion in their heads about someday, somehow, mm -hmm. uh, and then it happens. And mm -hmm. you go, okay, it's okay. now. All yeah. right, it's now and we're going to do it. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's a perfectly legitimate route to go. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in my case, because I came from a large family, and I was often in a caretaking situation, I, and I didn't really like it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> of your caring for your siblings? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and, and I, I just, I was, and I was young myself, mm -hmm. so those notions affected me, and I also don't think my mother was very happy being a mom. I think she loved us deeply. Mm -hmm. I don't think she was very happy. She certainly did not express and it. It may have not, she may have not regarded it as a choice. That's right. I think that's very mm -hmm. true. She had a, a short but a very vital nursing career before mm -hmm. she married my father. And I think that, that, uh, that she missed that. Mm -hmm. I think she really did. And that being a mom, as much as she wanted us, she really did but want Somehow when she got married, there, there was probably the expectation that they'd start a family. I that's mean, that, right. That exists today. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's, yes, that's right. And um, I also realized, not right away, but before I made the decision, I realized that I was the kind of person who um, had an interest in other things from 
I mean, a really big interest in like artistic things and mm -hmm. books and words. Mm -hmm. And at a very young age, I realized that I was a, a little bit of an odd duck for my family. Mm -hmm. And that also influenced me. And then I think um, historically, what you mentioned earlier, I lived for the first time. By the time I was um, uh, uh, able to conceive, mm -hmm. Birth control was on the horizon, and yes, and that really, was really re really good birth control. Right, yeah. right, and that made a huge difference yeah. in terms of my um, behavior, mm -hmm. in terms of my what I what I was doing with my boyfriends and how I was working. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so those things are all part of it. But then, I don't know if you remember this, but then at that time we both grew up late sixties, seventies. Mm -hmm that whole awareness of a woman being in charge of her body and the larger picture, the political picture or mm -hmm. the cultural mm -hmm. or environmental picture all came together. And we were hearing a lot about something we don't hear much about anymore, and that is population control. Yeah, for sure. And, and we were thinking about that in ways that uh, I don't see quite so much now. Mm. And that also factored into the choice. Mm -hmm. So all of this to say that it's both, it's a personal choice, it, it's a, a big picture choice, it's a choice, as you mentioned in our discussion, that may not just be a woman's choice, it may also be a couple's choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there, so the, the complexity that leads to this, I think, almost needs to be aired a little bit more than it has been because the question has gone quiet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think it's m my feeling that for the most part it's not considered a choice broadly in society. Right. Um, right. A lot of the old assumptions still exist, and so yes. um, I think it should be a more um, ongoing and perhaps public conversation. And yeah. so here we are. Here we are <laughs> doing the public conversation. And we have an amazing guest for this particular conversation. Stephanie Mills is here with us. And, uh, well, I think I'll wait until we get her on to tell the All story right, of her right. connection to me. So we will be right back with Ideas Live. Welcome back to Ideas Live. I'm Anne Marie Oman, and this is my co host, Karen Anderson. And we are talking today in our deep conversation about a very unusual subject being childless by choice. And our special guest today is Stephanie Mills, a dear friend and also author of several books having to do with the environment and ecology, whatever happened to ecology in service of, in praise. In, in, in praise of nature. In praise of nature and Epicurean simplicity, which happens to be my first, my favorite, mm -hmm. and uh, many, many other articles and books. And she has been a powerful influence on my life in this subject because, as we were talking about in our previous conversation, I had all these personal sort of concerns or um, thoughts about maybe not choosing to be a mom. And then I go to college, and somewhere in I, uh, the early 70s, I was given, in an ecology class, a copy of a speech uh, a graduation speech by a young woman graduating from Mills College who had said, and this is the time when the in, all the environmental issues are really heightened and I'm, I'm becoming aware of the bigger, the bigger picture outside of my farm community. And I get this speech in which you say, one of the kindest things you might be able to do for the world is to not have a child. And that sort of... Um, just escalated my awareness and and it became like oh I'm part of this larger picture and it turns out that much much later in the world I remember this speech for a long time but I don't remember the author I just remember the impact much much later in the world I find out that this is a speech written by Stephanie Mills in our in our previous writing group Yes. <laughs> that discovery came to light. Yeah, yeah. it was pretty yeah. powerful for me to realize that you had had this influence on my life because you it kind of coalesced around that oh, statement. So, interesting. so um, 
I think I was ripe for that kind of consciousness, but mm -hmm. at that point it was, here is the bigger picture too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, as you said, our reasons for maybe not having a child or having a child are complicated. But that was the one that finally yeah. um, made the difference for me. So I am just curious, just to give our listeners a little bit more understanding of your place, uh, what led to that? I mean, what was the background that started that story? Well, um, I was an unreconstructed liberal arts major <laughs> <laughs> in a uh, college in the Bay Area at a mm. time when ecological consciousness was really brimming. And Paul Ehrlich, the population mm. biologist, was right down the road. Um, so I organized uh, a symposium on campus that brought me closer to Ehrlich's thinking and, and to greater ecological awareness. And it was a time of tremendous uh, student activism, mm -hmm. uh, very decided uh, statements being made about taking a personal stand to uh, respond to planetary issues. Mm -hmm. and. So overpopulation looked to me like uh, a serious driver of a multitude of uh, ecological uh, calamities. And so I crafted a speech in which I said the most humane thing for me to do in light of environmental degradation was to have no children at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was predisposed to that to yeah. a certain extent, because um, uh, my mother was a feminist. And you know, when you uh, earlier uh, in the segment where you and Karen were discussing your sort of the roots of your uh, decision um, and how your own mother may have felt about mm -hmm. being a mother, uh, my mom was a whack, and uh, so wow. she had. Uh, an interesting episode in her life in an all sort of female environment mm -hmm. and an opportunity to exercise authority and all of that, which, you know, the post-war era and the feminine mystique just said, thanks ladies, you know, go back to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, I think that's part of the background that empowered me to make that choice. and. Also, as you mentioned, you know, the advent of safe, reliable, freely available birth control, which was not as um, contentious mm -hmm. uh, a right or freedom as it has become, mm -hmm. uh, was also really, really important. You know, it never occurred to me that I would not be able to sort of make that choice and stick to it, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, at that time. And you had shared with us that you were an only child, and did that, was that a, um, so that your parents, you know, wished for grandchildren, if indeed they had one, would be altered by your decision in, in a different way than yeah. if you had a bunch of siblings. Um, did that, did they respond no. to your speech They were that very way? proud of me. Were they? they were very proud of me. That's and uh, it just, they never, you know, mm -hmm. it never was a problem. And I think um, part of it too, I was thinking about this whole issue of, of a kind of family uh, of origin. Um, both of my parents were third generation college educated mm -hmm. and or I'm third generation college educated uh, in my generation of cousins uh, no children or one child families preponderate okay so I mean there are some grandchildren around but um, it wasn't a big I, I think there was something kind of in the background of our family mm -hmm. culture that wasn't mm -hmm. um, idolizing it children. Wasn't ch child it child didn't center, require maybe. it didn't require that as part yeah. of your yeah your definition yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah of fulfillment. Now you know whether that was was wise or sane. You know, it was a whole other discussion. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, 
But yeah. that was prevalent in, in your family. Yeah. yeah. I think so. So I'm curious then, the, that speech in 1969 launched a significant, I mean, cultural awareness mm -hmm. for a long time. And you were in the middle of this firestorm. How did that affect you? Oh, I'm wow. just curious. Well, um, I would say it uh, made me crazy for, <laughs> for a few years. I mean, I had yeah. just spent four years in a really sublime grove of academe, and all of a sudden I was out on the speaker circuit. And in that first year, I made 80 talks, you know, and was flying around the country. Oh, my gosh. John D. Rockefeller flew me back to discuss youth population in his offices in New York. And, um, and it was, you know, I had no compass for anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, but it was uh, on the job training, you yes. know, for yes. uh, thinking a quick study and debate and... Um, and sticking to a controversial position. That was, a, that was my question. Were people generally supportive of your decision or were there hostile responses as well? The hostile responses were uh, in the minority, okay. I would say. At that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there was a lot of support. And um, Although the decision to uh, remain childless was kind of a keynote, I also was talking about the broad ecological yes. situation and yes. how the growth of human numbers and sort of the growth of the human enterprise was degrading mm -hmm. um, the biosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that we forget is that the planet is limited. I mean, exactly. it's, this, it's a singular thing, and although it has... I think the, the, the ecosystem or the larger culture of environment has resilience, not when there are too many of I us. I remember the first time I heard, I don't remember when it was, but the, the, the phrase carrying capacity. Yes. That seemed riveting to me. I don't yeah. know, that, that made it real in a way that a lot of other um, descriptions did not. Ooh, wow! Like it and was a bus, and there was a num number of passengers that could go. Period. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a it's a wildlife biology concept, among other things. You mm -hmm. know, it's the number of organisms an environment can support in in perpetuity mm -hmm. without suffering degradation. And um, <clears throat> part of the thing that we still have difficulty accepting is that we are organisms in mm -hmm. an ecosystem. Right. And we're part of the whole thing. All the species are more important than any one particular mm -hmm. species. This is why Darwin still pisses people <laughs> off, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the people I read and respect think that about two billion is uh, the carrying capacity of the Earth. But here we are. Here we are at, at seven, seven or seven, so. Seven almost, yeah. 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 What has happened? Now, when I was working at NMC during that time, we had uh, Helen Caldicott came mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. And that was a while, quite a while ago now. Yeah. And, I, and spoke on, on overpopulation. And, I, and the one thing she said that just I carried with me was, if we don't solve this problem, we won't need to solve any of the other ones. Mm -hmm. But that was... I don't know, 15 years, 20 yeah. years ago. And it seems that that issue has kind of dropped yeah. out of the... Quiet, yeah. yeah. What has happened? Well, and we have um, 8 billion people. <laughs> well, we want to have our cake and eat it, too. Jeez. As, mm. as, you know, uh, collectively. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want to believe that we can do anything we want to the environment. We can feed everybody. And still have it be beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and sustain us. Uh, I was thinking about another thing that was going on in the 70s, really crucial uh, and endlessly reburied, was the publication of the Limits to Growth study, the world model that, you know, just objectively showed that if, if these trends, several trends, continue unchecked, we hit a point around 2020 where, you know, systems start collapsing. Mm -hmm. wow. 
And so, and the whole idea of limits is just kind of antithetical mm -hmm. uh, to the sort of expansionist spirit of industrial mm -hmm. civilization, mm -hmm. I think. And, and, and another reason I think that it's, you know, this issue has rolled back is definitely a feminist issue, you know? And I was thinking about how, I mean, there are people publicly elected representatives talking about punishing women who have abortion by hanging them. Yeah, I, I remember <laughs> running across that one too. And um, it made me think of, I think it's Frederick Douglass's statement that power never gives anything up without a struggle. So, you know, the struggle, I mean, it's not entirely, women's self-determination is not entirely unprecedented, but it's a long, long, long struggle. And I think the kind of backlash we're seeing, at least in, in mm -hmm. the U.S., mm -hmm. is part of that struggle. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is that it is possible in really benevolent ways to influence mores around family size. Can you give an and, example? Or? And the status of women. Um, well, uh, a program I'm really, uh, or an institution I'm really uh, supportive of is um, the Population Media Center, which uses, I mean, they certainly acknowledge that it's important that the means of birth control and maternal and child uh, care mm -hmm. are available mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. the board. Right. Uh, and, but the way you shift mores is through stories. And so they mm. uh, have uh, programs around, well, in the U.S. and around the world where they produce radio and television dramas, long-running stories in which uh, small families become the norm in which uh, spouse abuse uh, is, uh, you know, sort of dealt with appropriately in which child marriage um, is, you know, looked on uh, with disfavor. Um, and, and the stories and the characters just go on long enough so that uh, viewers and listeners can identify. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, and they have they get measurable results in. That is uh, fascinating. That is it amazing. really is. So it's not like you go in and, you know, sterilize people at gunpoint, which oh. was, you know, in the early days of concern that was one about of the fears. overpopulation, that was, one of the, mm -hmm. was that it would be compulsory, but it is possible to have a really benevolent, supportive influence in it, the lives of women and girls and their spouses and sibs. It seems to me that that idea of the storytelling is simply doing what always felt appropriate to me, which is make, educate about the choices, mm -hmm. and then people have their, then they have all the information. Then they can, they have, they have, you know, if the but only it, models that we have are models in which it is the expectation of a woman to have children, then that mm -hmm. narrows the choice because the information and the model for the other option isn't there. And that seems but to a, me, yeah, well, a, in a, part, but, but people do, I mean, there is a, a, a desire for families oh, sure. above reproductive, you know, of, above two. And so, yeah, modeling's really important, but at this point, it's, it is advocacy in, in, mm. of uh, smaller families. Sure. Is, is I think, quite critical. And, yeah. and the option of, of going childless, but that implies a lot of social change down the road. 50 years after you decide not to have children, then what, you know? Yeah, then what, exactly. <laughs> then what? E exactly, yeah. because children are, a part of, and I'm, and many of us are in that process now mm -hmm. where we're turning, we're care, doing a lot of caregiving for our parents. Yeah, yeah and you've done that too, yeah. I know. Um, 
I think this is this, that that whole idea of getting that information out is really um, really critical. One of the things I'm sometimes confused about, and I have been, perhaps you have too, and I don't know, you may be aware of, is why is the childless by choice pattern of life often derided? You know, I'm well, curious about, is it because it's, I mean, is it, it's, it confuses me that it's not just, okay, that was your choice. Do you, well, it's novel. It, 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 it's novel. To do it, uh, secularly is novel, mm -hmm. but you think about women in religious communities mm -hmm. over yeah. the centuries, um, which, you know, that was a place they could go to pursue a life of the mind, mm -hmm. a life mm -hmm. of prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, a That's exactly right. Solitude. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I take your point, and um, I guess because, uh, well, I, you know, I don't have a ready answer for well, that. Come okay. to think of it, but I was just thinking about nunneries and religious communities. And that was also, I mean, in some societies, that's a vernacular way of population stabilization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. And I think, well, I think of some of the incredible um, spiritual writing that's come out of women who made that, that choice, yeah. you know. Yeah. It seems to me that changing any of those expectations is difficult, such as the expectation that we're all going to get married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you look at what's changed in, I mean, since I've been you know, becoming an adult, um, the need to get married is, is, is almost gone away. I mean, living together, being single, all the rest and of it. Having it's having children very, together without being married, too. And yes. women having children without a spouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those kinds of things yeah. are kinds of pretty accepted now, and people don't think much about it. And yet, I think that choosing to not have children has um, not gained that kind of casual acceptance that some of these other changes have. And yeah. I, I can't answer that exactly, mm -hmm. but I think... Sometimes I wonder if choosing not to have children is a kind of threatening choice to those who have made the other decision. Yeah. Um, and oh. in one of the articles I was reading for background, um, someone talked about a ghost life, that everyone has a ghost life. That is the what if. What if, mm -hmm. you know, the life I would have had if mm -hmm. I hadn't had children or if I had had children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, my mother was a career homemaker, but um, I knew right away I didn't want her life. I just, there was a gut feeling that I wanted more than that. Mm -hmm. And I think she did too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. so I, I think it's a, I, I'm confused about why that choice is less acceptable, it, it appears, than all these other changes that we've made to open up what's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Well, it's early days. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, on the one That's hand, we're, we're kind of... We're in the early days. Well, we're <laughs> we down so to the wire yeah. with climate mm -hmm. change and extinction and fresh water and topsoil. So <laughs> it's late in the game of sustainability, but it's kind of early, early days of bodily women's bodily self Yes, and as you pointed out, yeah. in many yeah. ways, it's a mm -hmm. feminism, and those choices have gone forward and backward. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. It's not a yeah. steady progression toward yeah. um, freedom. Yeah. yeah, I think, I, I, but when I see young women, I see them making, as you said earlier, they're, um, they, s some of them seem better informed, but they do seem, mm, naive about some things, but they seem more independent. Mm -hmm. You know, I find mm -hmm. that in my young, yeah. in my young friends just seem yeah. a little more independent. Yeah. And I take that as a gesture of, yeah. of um, optimism. Yes, and you know, I, my young friends who are new parents and mm -hmm. who are very environmentally savvy, I think, have, have weighed the, those choices very uh, consciously, and having that that living 
you know, emissary to the future yes. in your life looks, uh, I mean, I do understand why people have children, you know, yeah, and, and have course had they do. children. I wonder if it would enhance their sense of responsibility about the planet, sending forth your children yeah, your into that future. Out there, yeah, you definitely have some skin in the game, as they, yeah. as they yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. Do you find a way, I mean, it sounds also um, grim. Do, do you still find ways to be optimistic that we can change and survive, you know, as a species and as multiple species on this planet? Um, it's a big question. Big question. We'll come back with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, as I said, we're, we're down to the wire. Yeah. You know, there's like 40% less wildlife in the world mm -hmm. in this century, 75% decline in insect life. You know, um, it's, I guess what gives me hope is that I see people not giving up on what I consider to be uh, wise and uh, life affirming responses to this plight and they have to do with building small resilient regenerative communities mm -hmm. not you know I'm not optimistic that industrial civilization is going to be able to continue <laughs> because it's premised on finite resources mm -hmm. but I am I do see people offering and, and tendering up, you know, wonderful, meaningful uh, actions to take in local communities that together could coalesce mm -hmm. um, to constitute community resilience and a hope of survival on a planet that has been depleted and may be regenerated. Mm -hmm. So if we... I, yeah. The choice to have children may not even, I mean, your idea of choosing not to have children didn't catch on in as big a way as we might have hoped. Yes. Not that you were the only, charged with that responsibility, thank goodness. No, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not everybody's, uh, I'm not everybody's you cup did, of tea. You, you <laughs> did spearhead many of the, yeah. uh, the consciousness about, about m much of that. I find it affirming that I think young couples, not everywhere, but there is a significant number of young couples who are grappling with the decision together. I mean, yes, it's a woman's body who is, mm -hmm. is, is going to carry a child, but a, 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 a couple, and, I'm, and, I'm, and nowadays it's not always just a man and a woman. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a, a couple of women. Or, or sometimes it's a surrogate. Mm -hmm. A couple of men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and in that case, I think that that mutual decision being thoughtful and not just simply expected, mm -hmm. but that whole mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. that there's a thoughtful conversation going on about whether to bring a child onto this planet, is that to me is a gesture of optimism too. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that that's really, yeah. really powerful. Yeah, yeah, when you think about it, um, I mean, if there ever was a decision that people should be extremely conscious mm -hmm. and mindful mm -hmm. about of the big it picture, is bringing a child into the world, yeah, and, but and I, I, doing that casually, mm. which is, I mean, people have done that casually for millennia <laughs> yes. because there were natural checks mm -hmm. to population growth, yes, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes tragic ones. Well, it, yeah, it, it is normal, you know. There's every customer gets a birth and a death, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's normal, you know. Uh, disease and scarcity are mm -hmm. among the checks that have, you know, mm -hmm. kept human population stable. And the 20th century, with advances in public health and and a kind of a spurt in agricultural production, spurred population growth and just in time could have been you know the availability of birth control and good mm -hmm. reproductive care could you know that mm -hmm. could yeah we could have 
-hmm. Take a moment. You could have. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. But uh, social, social mores um, lag behind scientific advances in a way that mm -hmm. that has, I think, kept us from doing that. I, we've talked a lot about sort of the global perspective on this. Um, in terms of the personal piece of it, I, before we wrap up and we're kind of closing in, um, have you had any second thoughts about, you know, having children? Do you ever think, boy, I wish I had a kid or not? Or, um, you know, what's it been like living for all these years with that decision? Mm. Um, um, well, of course I've had second thoughts. I, I, yeah. uh, Nikki Giovanni recently was here mm -hmm. and she said, you know, for a writer, uh, if you live long enough and you haven't contradicted yourself, you're doing, <laughs> right. doing something wrong, you yes. know. Um, however, uh, it's, it's satisfied me and served, served me well, served me well. Okay. Um, Yep, that's a good way. To I answer. think I think that I that is a very good way. I, when you said it, I said yes. That's how I feel, as well. Mm -hmm. You know that it had for my particular personality, for my drives, my artistic will, mm -hmm. and also it has served my, not my immediate, but my my mm -hmm. my family well too, because mm -hmm. I've been available to them in a way I don't think I would have mm -hmm. been. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the as the childless aunt of mm -hmm. many, many mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nephews and nieces, I've been able to play a role that I don't yeah. think I would have. And so they, there's that, you know, that's a yes. larger cultural picture. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Um, I, I'm also curious as to what would we say to young women coming into this decision? I mean, as you said, and you've reiterated, it's a decision that's ongoing mm -hmm. and it's not without its regrets, perhaps, and not without its complications. Mm -hmm. But what would we say to someone to increase the sense of awareness? Hmm. Um, I would. I just want to point to this wonderful book. Other, uh -huh. other than mother choosing childlessness with life in mind. It's by an English author. I don't know if we can get it in the U.S. Sure. But um, it's it's kind of a memoir and a workbook about arriving at that decision mindfully mm -hmm. mm. and she comes from a buddhist perspective so okay. mm. the sense of interdependency with all mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. is really a foundation mm -hmm. that she offers for people to consider such a decision you know i think that what you just said is one of the biggest messages that we could offer i would offer a young a young woman and that is that this sort of vision of the world as interdependent Mm -hmm. That we, we're stuck kind of in these minds that are gifts, of course, and, and we're absorbed in them. But we are, the larger picture, the truthful picture is the one where we're all connected. We're all into And that, that decision is part of the big picture. Mm -hmm. and, we are, and we are able to influence it in that way. Yeah. One of the other things that came up that I would add in my reading about this was um, sometimes people say they, they want to have children because it's their legacy, it's my mm -hmm, influence mm -hmm. going forward, and that um, to remind ourselves that there are many ways to leave a legacy. Oh, yes. And, and especially for women now, today, mm -hmm. there are so many more opportunities than there were mm -hmm. um, uh, to make art, mm -hmm. to start a business, to mm -hmm. create to create something mm -hmm. without procreating. Mm -hmm. um, that it, yes. And I think and that's an important world, piece of yeah. it. Um, and other people pointed out that they thought their marriages were better when, because they didn't have children, that the relationship came first. And I mm -hmm. think that's, um, that's an option that should be stated out loud, yes. that children don't always <clears throat> enhance a marriage. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, it's a, so it, it, it's a, stressful, a mm -hmm. stressful time as it well is. as rewarding. I think, if I think about it, my daughter has probably been a major source of joy in my life mm -hmm. and also a major source of pain and, mm -hmm. and worry sure. and, mm -hmm. and struggle. Anxiety, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's the whole picture. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, you know, there are no perfect decisions. No. 
uh, maybe um, you can't have it all. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and so uh, opting not to have children definitely means you're going to be missing out on some fairly profound mm -hmm. life experiences and having other rewarding mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't, I think the idea that we can have it all is something we might need to relinquish here oh, yeah. yes. pretty quickly. Yes, yes. As, a, as a planet and as a person. And as a species. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Stephanie, okay. this has been so insightful, and you have been, I, I mean, you are so precise and clear about this, and I'm just so grateful. You oh, helped gosh. clear the air. Thank you Thanks for so sharing much. Thank you no, so it's just much. A pleasure well, to have you, you here. You all are, are inspirations to me, and oh. wise, articulate women, for sure. <laughs> thank well, you. thank you so much, and we'll be right back with Ideas Live. Welcome back to Ideas Live. I'm Anne-Marie Oman, and this is my co-host, Karen Anderson. And we have just completed a deep conversation on the subject of being childless by choice with Stephanie Mills, author of Whatever Happened to Ecology and Epicurean Simplicity. And what a conversation. Wow. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I feel uh, m much more keenly aware of the complexities of mm -hmm. the decision mm -hmm. and of the historical context for the decision and then also of the ecological context yes. for the decision. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm walking away with a bigger picture. We've said yeah, that before. A sense of profound responsibility. Yes. That that's the context in which a decision like that should be made. And it occurred to me that these kinds of conversations should be happening all the time. And they and should be not. happening in everybody's in, households, in too. Families, you know. right. Yeah, with um, young girls especially, but with all of us. I mean, it never would have occurred to me to have this kind of conversation or to even ask my parents, are you glad you had children? Or would you do it again? Or what about this decision? I'm struggling. I mean, none of that happened. And I, mm -hmm. I think it would be so helpful if it were, I don't know why it's, not done more often. It's a, it's touchy. It's like asking someone to justify their life. I think my mother felt obliged to say, of course I'm glad. <laughs> but oh, we need sure. to be more open to um, revising our versions of ourselves. I think that's a wonderful way to say it, is that I think it's all right to have made a choice one way or the other. And then to say, I also consider, what was it you called it, the ghost the, version? A, a ghost life. The yeah, ghost the, life. The what if. What mm -hmm. kind of, what would I have what, what, what might I have done if I had not done this? Mm -hmm. And then bringing also into that conversation this that where we ended up, that final idea that we are all part of something. We're not separate from the mm -hmm. natural world. We're not separate from the environment. We're a part of that, and we're an active. And we are one of the parts of it that has some sense of will and, and as you said, responsibility. I think those are remarkable things to think about and mull and to share with your children, you know, about their decision making. So And it occurs to me that there are plenty of children in the world that need love and attention. You don't necessarily have to give birth to them. <laughs> That's right. And there and there and are the, other ways that you can do that. There's yeah. lots of ways to have children in your life and to and to give them the care that they need without raising them. Yeah. Um, and because we are so interconnected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think well, that's a really nice way to good. close this down. I am sure that we'll be thinking about this one for a while, and I'm, I'm really so grateful because. to Stephanie for giving us the, 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 you know, the bedrock of information. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Happy we'll Mother's be back Day. next month. <laughs> yeah. Oh.